Okay, we're going to get started. This is Michael Morris. I'm the Executive Director of the National Disability Institute. I appreciate the, so many of you joining us from around the country. This is the fourth in a five-part monthly webinar series of our relatively new Center for Disability Inclusive Community Development, which began back uh, this summer in the month of June. Today, our uh, webinar is on the important topic of workforce development and meeting obligations under CRA, the Community Reinvestment Act. Before I introduce you to our panelists and uh, we get this webinar underway, uh, I'm going to turn it back to Katie to just uh, provide you some of uh, the logistical information in terms of how to listen to the webinar or participate potentially if you have questions. Katie? Thanks, Michael. One moment here, everyone. All right. So for listening to today's webinar, the audio for today's meeting can be accessed using your computer audio or by calling in by phone. If you select computer audio, please make sure that your speakers are turned on or your headphones are plugged in. If you do not have sound capabilities on your computer or if you prefer to listen by phone, uh, dial 1-929-205-6099 and the meeting code is 632-483-895. Captioning for the webinar. Uh, we do have real-time captioning during this webinar. The captions can be found by clicking on the closed caption, the CC button, in your Zoom controls at the bottom of the screen. If you do not see the captions after clicking the button, you can alert the host, uh, the name is NDI Webinars, via the chat box. You may also view the captions in your browser um, by going to the URL HTTP colon forward slash forward slash www.streamtext.net forward slash player question mark event equal signs NDI. For submitting questions, use the Q&A box to submit any questions that you have during the webinar and we will direct them accordingly. If your question is not answered during the webinar, or you are listening by phone and not logged in, you may email the webinar host, Katie Achenbach, at K-A-U-C-H-E-N-B-A-C-H -E at N-D-I-I-N-C dot O-R-G. For technical assistance, if you experience any technical difficulties during the webinar, please use the chat box to send a message to the NDI host or again email Katie Achenbach at K-A-U-C-H-E-N-B-A-C-H at N-D-I hyphen I-N-C dot O-R-G. And please note that this webinar is being recorded and the materials will later be placed on the NDI website um, at our webinars page, which you can find by going to the website homepage um, selecting resources from the top navigation, and then webinars. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Michael. Um, I do have a note. I think the access code listed um, for the audio might have been incorrect, so I'm going to double check that, and I will put that into the chat box uh, to all mem uh, attendees today. Um, so I will double check that for everyone. Um, and Michael, if you want to kick us off. Thank you, Katie. And again, thank you all for joining us from across the country. Um, this, uh, as I just mentioned a few minutes ago, is the fourth in a five-part series of webinars that are kicking off our new Center on Disability Inclusive Community Development. If you have missed any of the previous webinars, they are archived on our website at nationaldisabilityinstitute.org and then look under uh, the work of NDI and you will find a, a very robust and growing website 
where the previous uh, webinars are being archived. Today, our topic is workforce development and meeting obligations under the Community Reinvestment Act. Before we get started with our panelists, I do want to uh, let you know uh, as a disclaimer that the views and opinions expressed in this presentation are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of any of the government agencies or organizations mentioned. So um, take that for what it is, uh, but I am very excited about the panelists we have uh, who will be presenting to you today. Uh, after uh, their presentations, I have some pre-prepared questions, and we will also be taking up questions that you may be entering in the chat box. So our first panelist you're going to hear from today is Stephen Shepelwich, Senior Community Development Advisor with the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City, uh, working out of the Oklahoma City branch. You will also be hearing from Virgil Miller, Group CRA Director in Group Compliance at Arvest Bank. You will be hearing from Sabrina Ware, Director Goodwill, Tulsa Works and Job Connection, and also Lisa Mufflin, District Community Affairs Officer with the Office of the Controller of the Currency. Next slide, please. So for our agenda, first we want to present to you an overview of the Community Reinvestment Act, sort of leveling the playing field. I recognize many of you may be quite aware of CRA, particularly those of you working uh, for financial institutions. Um, but we're, we're going to do an overview of CRA and its relationship to workforce development and how the two can work together. You're going to hear about some of the nuts and bolts of CRA and how they apply to workforce development. We're going to actually share with you discussion of partnership opportunities and how a bank looks at partnerships around the Community Reinvestment Act based on their uh, individual experiences. We will also talk about the benefits for partnering with a bank, lessons learned from prior experiences, and we will share with you one story of partnership between a bank and a nonprofit so that you can uh, really, uh, we can dive deeper and understand what are some common elements, key strategies that you can take away from this webinar. And then finally, we're going to take on uh, first, some questions we have pre-prepared, and certainly we will go to questions you may provide us in the chat box. Okay, next slide, please. So our first presenter is Stephen Schiepelwich, is a Senior Community Development Advisor at the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City, Oklahoma City branch. Steve's work has been to promote economic development and fair and impartial access to financial services in Oklahoma's low to moderate income communities, and he manages the district's workforce development program uh, areas. In this role, he has led research and outreach initiatives on the district's unbanked market, innovations in consumer financial services, asset-based approaches to rural development, and workforce development strategies. He is the co-author of a wonderful article on engaging workforce development, a framework for meeting CRA obligations. Steve has worked with national groups focused on expanding the roles of financial institutions in low-income communities, including banks and credit unions, microenterprise funds, and affordable housing loan funds throughout the country. He began his work uh, internationally in the world of microfinance, rural development, and refugee pro program in Kenya, Burundi, and India for over six years. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Steve and the next slide, who will start us off with some kind of leveling the playing field for our audience, which represents really diverse participants in the world of disability, as well as from financial institutions, public agencies, and of course, uh, banking regulators. Steve, let me turn it over to you, and thank you for being with us today. 
Thank you so much, Michael. It's great to be able to connect our work with the, at the Federal Reserve with the work of NDI and seeing how we can in, further engage financial institutions in this work of providing services to people with disabilities and others. I think oftentimes when people think of the Federal Reserve, they don't connect us with economic development and community development, much less workforce development issues. And I have to, you know, one of the questions is, how are we engaged in this and why? Well, the overall goal of the Federal Reserve is to have a strong and growing economy for the nation as a whole. And we believe for that to happen, everybody must be able to both participate in the economy as well as benefit from it. And so to further that goal in those, in those activities, we've developed the Community Development Department within the Federal Reserve System. Every Federal Reserve, all 12 across the country, has a Community Development Department within it that's focused on strategies that assist low and moderate income communities. And this department was established in the early 80s in response to the Community Reinvestment Act legislation that was passed in 1977 that places uh, an obligation or incentivizes financial institutions that take deposits to reinvest in the communities that they, that they work in. At that time when it passed, part of the question was, well, how can banks do this in a safe and sound manner? How can banks um, take active part in community and economic development and so in, in response, our department was formed. Over the years, we've expanded beyond just a focus on financial institutions and their work, and, but we're always grounded within that. Um, we've looked, we were engaged in small business, affordable housing programs, in part because that is kind of the main way that um, financial institutions uh, meet their obligations under the Community Reinvestment Act. But we've also expanded beyond those types of activities to many others. And our most recent area is in the field of workforce development. This is really grounded in the Great Recession. And as we were coming out of the Great Recession, we were seeing that the labor markets weren't responding in the ways that we expected them to, as they had in, the, in past recoveries. So we started looking into that and say, well, what is going on here within workforce development and labor markets? As we started looking into that, our focus first turned to say, well, what is the role of banks and how does it relate to CRA, since that kind of is our, is our home. And I remember it at the time talking with a banker that was the chair of their regional workforce investment board, and we were talking and, and I just asked her, yeah, how does this relate to your CRA strategy? She looked at me and it was just like, she had never thought about that, had never connected the two. And what we had found was that banks, banks were engaged, are engaged in, in workforce development oftentimes, but do it because they see themselves as an employer or as a good corporate citizen, um, as a good civic partner in the area, but not really seeing it tied back to the CRA. So we started looking into that issue as a way to be able to drive further engagement and get them more involved in workforce development strategies. We've done a number of those things and we'll talk about in a little bit here, but one of those um, pieces that we worked on in the very beginning was that there's this document called the CRA Q&A, which is published in the Federal Registry and which everybody that's interested in CRA should take a good look at because it kind of lays out examples of what you know, what kind of activities are um, included or count towards CRA um, recognition. And it's, it's not meant to be, you know, only those things fit, it's much more as a menu to promote ideas, but if it's in there, it really helps. And bankers were telling us, you know, this is interesting around workforce development, but it's not in the, C it's not in the CRA Q&A. It's not there, we don't see it. So we're a little bit more standoffish. So we worked for about two years on getting these 16 words, that you'll, about 16 words you'll see in blue on this first slide, added into the CRA Q&A, basically giving as a clear example that banks can work with um, 
strategies that improve access to jobs or to job training or workforce development programs, and also to provide access to daycare and other supportive services. And we realize that supportive services are so important for people to both get and maintain employment. So we saw that as a very big win that really opened up the door for both sides, for bankers to start looking at this field and for people in the workforce to field to say, okay, we now have a toehold that we can, we can latch on to. So that was one of our very first steps. We can look at the next slide now. And as we look at workforce development, you know, just as a bit of an overview to kind of level the field, as Michael was saying, you know, at first glance, it seems like it should be pretty straightforward. It's about connecting up somebody with a job, uh, that wants a job, to somebody that has a job and needs a worker. It should be a very straightforward connection, very straightforward transaction, but it really gets complicated as you get into the details. Things around skills mismatch, um, soft skills and hard skills, jobs are structured uh, appropriately for the types of um, employable people within the community, how, uh, what employability even looks like and is defined, spatial mismatch, all of these different things come to play and as workforce development professionals start to really dig in to serving populations with very specific needs and barriers, it becomes even more difficult. But that opens up an opportunity, an opportunity to serve new people in new ways. Now then we step back and say, okay, well what is in workforce development, what does that encompass? Well, there is the public workforce system, which is um, supported by federal and state dollars and is guided by some key legislation. And as we were starting to work on this after the you know, recovery from the Great Recession, a key piece of legislation was passed called the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act. And I say it's key because it directs most, a lot of the workforce development um, funding from the public side, but also it was key in terms of thinking about banks and their role because it had a couple of foundational kind of principles that are listed here. You know, local control of workforce issues with local boards, which lines up with local banks having local assessment areas for their CRA, a focus on low and moderate income individuals and disadvantaged populations, which marries up with the CRA's focus on similar populations. The Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act put a real focus on developing partnerships, expanding who should be involved in this, and which opens the door for looking at banks in a new way as being partners within it. Um, there's a need to, to have data being provided, having performance metrics, and that data and performance metrics collected through workforce development programs can be a real key for engaging banks because banks need similar data, one for reporting on CRA, but also for um, their own strategic planning and as they develop their programs. And then finally, we owe a, has a huge focus on innovation. Let's try new things in new ways. And as you'll hear about um, when Lisa Mifflin talks about the CRA, this idea of innovation and responsiveness to local needs is a key part of the CRA as well. So this kind of confluence of this legislation and the need can really open up new doors for banking engagement with the workforce sector. As we look at the next slide, you know, as we said, workforce development can be very complicated as it gets down in the weeds, and there's a couple of reasons for that. You know, one is who does need to be served, who does benefit from workforce development activities, and when you think of it that way, it's basically everybody is involved. And sometimes it's just a matter of saying, you know, highlighting how you are involved in the workforce development field. Banks are involved as employers, as needing employees, needing skilled staff to come in. And we can see all types of different partners engaged in workforce development, 
Some of the keys are the workforce investment boards, uh, colleges, post-secondary educa education institutions, service providers and their associations like NDI and its affiliates, members, chambers of commerce, and others. So we all have a stake in workforce development in different ways. The question is, how do we bring them together? And how we bring them together depends, in some ways, on these different strategies. And again, on this, there are many that have been developed and tried over time, sector strategies, career pathways. I won't go into detail on these, just highlight them to say that it's a real strength for the field to be able to work with banks and say, we can bring together different partners, different strategies, mix and match together to meet the needs of specific populations in a way that has outcomes also for our stakeholders, like banks and other funders. So there's a real strength there. What we have done, and you'll see, oh, before we go that on the next slide, as we talk about what some of those benefits can be, we can see a number here, uh, the benefits to banks. As I mentioned, banks are employers that need, need workers. There's a huge need nationally for customer, ser customer service representatives that are bilingual, for example. And we can think of some great programs around the country that have focused on that, seeing the bank as the end customer and the banks can also invest in developing those types of programs. You could look at a bank working with a sector in the economy that's focused on making loans to that economy, that sector and say, we understand what your workforce needs are and we are working with service providers to develop that pipeline of machinists or technologists or skilled trades that come in and support the sectors that we are uh, lending to. Banks benefit through working with workforce development because of that responsiveness and innovation that's available there. Even just by being, you know, one of the first banks in the market to be engaged in workforce development could make them stand out in terms of telling their story around CRA. And as I mentioned, all of that data can be of use in terms of developing those regional contacts, seeing their markets in different ways. Now we'll look on the next slide and you know, one of, you'll see on the right-hand side there the picture of a publication that we put out called Engaging Workforce Development, a Framework for Meeting CRA Obl Obligations. This is available online at our website. The list the address is there. This really goes into detail on the framework I've kind of just walked through. It provides um, an overview of both workforce development and CRA obligations. It also goes into detail on you know, describing these partners and these strategies and how they can be mixed and matched. And then it highlights about six case studies of bank engagement. So you can get a real in-depth view there through that publication. We wrote it. We wrote it primarily for bankers, but with the realization that it's Workforce development partners, nonprofits are the ones that can grab hold of this and start to understand the language of bankers when they go to engage with them. That was one thing we've done. We've also added those 16 words in, as I mentioned. We have developed training for all bank examiners. So all examiners at CRA within the Federal Reserve System have had to go through training on what workforce development means and what it looks like so that they'll know it when they see it in the field to be able to recognize it. And we've had a, a, a number of webinars and trainings similar to this uh, that we're doing now that are archived on our website as well, so you can go in depth. So again, just to recap, a quick overview of workforce development, a quick overview of the CRA, and how the two can come together with banks and, and local partners. And I'd like to hand it over to um, Lisa Mifflin now to kind of take us down deeper into workforce, into CRA and kind of the nuts and bolts of what that legislation is about and how it plays out in practice. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. And Lisa, I'll just, I won't read this uh, 
uh, complete slide which gives background of, of your work as a district community affairs officer at OCC, the Office of Control of the Currency. But uh, what's very clear from your overview is you are uh, directly responsible for technical assistance, uh, working with stakeholders in Florida, Oklahoma, and Northeast Texas on the relationship between CRA and workforce development. So I think I'll, I'll, I'll stop there and turn it over to you and, and your slide presentation on work, next slide, workforce development and meeting obligations under CRA. Next slide. Well, thank you. And good afternoon. So Steve gave a little uh, overview, but let's talk about how CRA is connected to workforce development. Next slide. The prior webinars in the series have discussed the Community Reinvestment Act in depth, but as a uh, brief overview and refresher, the Community Reinvestment Act encourages regulated financial institutions to meet the credit needs of the communities in which they operate, including low and moderate income and neighborhoods, consistent with safe and sound banking operations. So the bank's role in complying with the Community Reinvestment Act is to provide their CRA activities, those being loans, investments, and services, to regulators to demonstrate responsiveness in meeting community needs and the communities in which they operate, which for CRA purposes are referred to as their assessment areas. The regulator's role is to review the bank's CRA activities, rate the bank's CRA performance, and issue a public report, and also to take the bank's CRA record into account when reviewing applications for bank corporate activities like branching and mergers. Next slide. So there are, regardless of the bank's size or structure, all regulated financial institutions have a CRA evaluation. The type of evaluation and activities considered depend on the size of the bank. And this was discussed previously, but I just like to always emphasize on this one message to get out of this slide is that when you're looking for opportunities for partnerships, it goes beyond the um, mega banks or the, the banks that you may uh, have more name recognition in your communities because all banks have a CRA obligation and particularly some of the, the intermediate and the small and the large banks are looking for those opportunities for community development. Next slide. So one of the areas that we look at is the bank's lending record for CRA. And here we're looking at their home mortgage loans, that's for purchase, home refinance, or home improvement. We're also looking at lending to small businesses and then or small farms, and also consumer lending if that represents a significant portion of the bank's lending. In reviewing these types of loan products, we're reviewing the incomes of the borrowers for home mortgage loans to determine the percentage of lending that's done to LMI persons or in LMI geographies. When we're reviewing a bank's small business lending, we're looking specifically at what percentage of the bank's lending for businesses is to small businesses and then small businesses in low and moderate income areas. Next slide. And so the lending for CRA applies to all banks but specifically for large and intermediate banks, we are also looking at a bank's community development activities. And so these are loans, investments, and services specifically related to the categories that you see here. So what types of transactions, intentional transactions, is the bank doing related to affordable housing for lower moderate income individuals, community services targeted to lower moderate income individuals, activities that promote economic development so small business financing that creates jobs for low and moderate income individuals. And then activities that revitalize or stabilize certain geographies, and you see those geographies listed here. Next slide. So when we go deeper into the economic development component of community development, this is where consideration for workforce development activities is discussed. So as you see here, the activities that are specifically listed in our guidance, our CRA Q&As that Steve referred to earlier, there is a specific component that gives CRA consideration for activities that support government initiatives for job training or workforce development. Next slide. And so consideration for job training and workforce development activities wasn't always explicit under CRA. 
after you gave you some of that background and you see the narrative here and also on the next slide. So in our 2016 CRA guidance, when it was updated, it was based on the feedback that Steve gave some history about from community development stakeholders that wanted it more explicitly considered and, and listed as being a activity that can get CRA consideration. Next slide. So by having job training and workforce development activities explicitly included in the guidance, this removed any gray area for bankers, but also for examiners about how these activities are connected to community development for low and moderate income persons. And because when we're talking about particularly financing small businesses that create jobs, recognizing the connection between job training to ensure that low and moderate income people have the opportunity to access those new jobs that are created. And even in terms of revitalizing certain low-income communities where there may be new employers coming into the area, the opportunity to have, participate in job training so that they can be available and ready to have an opportunity to compete for those jobs. Next slide. So how can a bank get CRA credit for supporting workforce development activities? So on the next slide, I mentioned that banks provide loans, qualified investments, and services for community development under CRA. So on this next slide are some examples that are specifically listed in our guidance that describe activities related to workforce development. And so if you'll move to the next slide where we have the examples. So let's go beyond that because, and I'll give you some these broad narratives and I'll give you some actual examples. So for example, a bank can provide a loan to a nonprofit that provides job training to support the nonprofit operations or programs. So this would be a community development loan that is made to that nonprofit and the nonprofit has a mission that includes job training for low and moderate income people. Another example is a bank provides a grant to a workforce development organization to support a job training program for low and moderate income people. This will be considered a qualified investment under CRA. Another example is bank employees teach financial education to participants in a job training program. This would be considered a community development service where the participants are low and moderate income job trainees. Uh, another example is bank employees could also provide financial education to low and moderate income workers at a job site as part of an on-the-job training program, an apprenticeship program, or a program to promote banking to the un or underbanked. Next slide. And then here you see specifically some service activities. And so these are the types of activities that can assist workforce, workforce development programs by providing bank staff expertise related not just to financial services, but also expertise areas like marketing, human resources, or technology. So for example, a bank human resource person can assist the job training program and its clients with resume writing, job interview training, or work readiness programs. And we also like to uh, recommend that service activities are a good way to get a banker engaged in your organization and your work. So inviting banks to participate in community development service activities can be a good starting point to develop a relationship so the bank staff can learn more about your organization as a pathway to future partnerships. Next slide. And then last, I want to talk a little bit about retail banking services and how this can also fit into a workforce development program. Uh, regulators will consider retail banking services that improve access to financial services or decrease banking costs for low and moderate income individuals through the types of accounts that you see listed here. So in relation to workforce development programs, these types of banking products can be paired with job training programs to promote banking access for LMI trainees or workers. So for example, a max savings program or an individual development account that can be done in partnership with a job training program where seed funding can be provided by local government, a community foundation, a bank or other sources. And then as trainees go through the programs, the funds are matched by one of those other entities and at the end of the program, the trainees have access to those funds for whatever their their needs may be in relation to their job training. And so that can be beneficial to allow them to purchase work-related items or assist with transportation needs to a new job. 
Next slide. And so that's all my comments. This last slide is just some resources. I have the link here to the Q&As that Steve had mentioned, but also to the website for the FSIEC, which lists examination schedules and how to access the public evaluations. Our OCC website, which has community affairs publications on a variety of topics, including how banks have partnered on various community development programs. And then lastly, the FDIC, which uh, through their bank find portal and their deposit market share portal, you can get information on what banks are in your markets and how what their level of presence is. If you're exploring how to begin partnerships with banks, it's important to know what banks are actually operating in your market. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa, so much. Um, I think you, you've amplified uh, Steve's uh, beginning explanations of, of the, the connection between CRA, Community Reinvestment Act uh, obligations, and, and workforce development activities. We're next going to turn to Virgil Miller, uh, who uh, is going to share with us uh, how uh, one example of, of an actual partnership uh, that uh, is uh, flowing from this area of CRA and workforce development. Virgil is the group CRA director for Arvest Bank Operations. He's been with them since uh, uh, 2013. He has over 40 years in the banking industry, most of it focused on CRA compliance and community development. Uh, most recently, he has been senior vice president and CRA officer with uh, and Director of Community Development for the Metropolitan National Bank in Little Rock, Arkansas. Um, and uh, so, you know, uh, Virgil, before you even go into your slides, it might be helpful, um, uh, and, and I know I'm jumping into a question, but um, as a, given your title as a CRA Director, what does that mean? And then maybe from that you can flow into uh, what do banks need to do to present to examiners regarding CRA activity? Maybe a little bit more about what does that job entail? Okay. Well, well, thanks, uh, Michael. Thanks for that introduction. And uh, I'd, I'd love to talk uh, about um, you know, that specific position because what, what we have found is that um, our banks and most banks, commercial banks, they're going to gravitate toward uh, where the economic activity is taking place in their communities. I mean, I've worked for several banks, as you can see, and banks don't have uh, banks have whole departments uh, that work with uh, high net worth uh, individuals. Uh, they can call it one-on-one -on -one banking. They can call it relationship banking. They've called it different things at the different places I've been. Uh, and so they know how to work with uh, individuals that have uh, high net worth, uh, and they gravitate towards areas that may be uh, upper and middle income areas because that's where economic activity takes place. Uh, and every bank should do that. That's a great part of the business. Uh, but certainly when it comes to uh, meeting the credit needs of uh, the other end of that spectrum, uh, those areas that are in moderate and in low income areas and those uh, communities that are defined as low and moderate income, uh, sometimes uh, our bankers need a little guidance. Uh, and so as the group CRA director, uh, we go out much like a bank examiner and try to determine uh, what the uh, credit needs are in those uh, markets where we're located. Uh, what the needs are of the low and moderate income communities. Uh, and we do that uh, by um, conducting interviews with uh, nonprofit organizations, uh, government organizations, foundations uh, that can tell us uh, what is going on in that market as it relates to uh, the credit needs of that market. So uh, in my role, I can really get out and, and do that and uh, then communicate back with our banks what I have discovered uh, as uh, some of the credit needs, and then we can let our community development representatives, our staff, go out and then try to engage uh, individuals and organizations uh, as it relates to our compliance uh, with the CRA. And so giving direction uh, for our banks are extremely important because, again, um, 
you know, banks are going to naturally gravitate toward uh, those areas where a lot of economic opportunities uh, taking place, and that's generally going to be in upper and middle income areas uh, and with high net worth individuals and organizations. Um, we work very hard to meet the credit needs of the entire community as what CRA talks about, uh, and, and so that my position allows us to work with those individuals, work with those organizations that work with low and moderate income individuals, uh, families, and work with low and moderate income uh, organizations that work with low and moderate income clients. Uh, and so it's a very satisfying job, and uh, we take it very seriously uh, because banks uh, now, you will hear this phrase, this phrase, corporate social responsibility. And indeed, some banks have positions, have a director of corporate social responsibility. And what that means, and certainly what it means for us at Arvest, is that we believe when the whole community prospers, uh, all the businesses in the community prospers, and certainly our bank would prosper. And so we get, just can't focus in on meeting the needs of one segment of the community uh, and not try to meet the needs of the entire community. And certainly CRA requires us to meet the entire needs of the community. Again, as uh, Stephen and Lisa said, um, uh, in a safe and sound way, specifically working with low and moderate income individuals and families. So that position that I have uh, allows us to do that and allows us to uh, talk about our corporate social responsibility and understanding that uh, when we help the total community, low and moderate income community included, then uh, our whole business, our banks, and the community as a whole will prosper. So uh, thanks, Michael, for letting me talk a little bit about that. I appreciate that. Oh, so next slide. Let's talk about uh, what do banks need to present to examiners regarding CRA activity, and certainly uh, Lisa and Steve talked a little bit about that, um, but certainly the activity uh, has to be community development and purpose, and uh, Lisa talked about that as it relates to uh, you know affordable housing uh, for low and moderate income individuals, or community services talk, uh, targeted to low and moderate income uh, individuals, and promoting economic development and restabilizing or stabilizing, revitalizing, stabilizing certain uh, geographies. Uh, so it has to have that main purpose. So an organization has to know, you know, do they fit in one of those boxes uh, as it relates to CRA? Uh, the activity uh, that an associate is involved with, a volunteer service, does it relate to a provision of financial service, even if we work with an organization that uh, meets uh, a community development purpose? One of the perfect examples that I – used to give out all the time and I still use is Habitat for Humanity that most uh, individuals uh, know about the work of Habitat that builds affordable housing primarily for low and moderate income individuals. They are a community development organization as it relates to that because they're building affordable housing. If we have an associate that volunteers and we have associates that go out and volunteer and they build the house, uh, they have bill days, uh, or we take our grill out and we grill lunch for everyone, and those, act, those are activities that we want to be involved with and we are involved with when it comes to our partnerships with Habitats. But that is not going to give us CRA consideration for service because there's no provision of financial service. Now, if our associate that volunteers say with Habitat is on the board providing guidance regarding financial matters, or they're the treasurer of the board, or they teach classes to families uh, that uh, need to uh, understand budgeting and banking, then that is a provision of financial service. And certainly, as Lisa talked about, uh, is it related to their job? If we have our HR person come out and do um, uh, work with uh, the Habitat to help them with their updating their uh, uh, benefits manual, 
then that would give us credit. If we have uh, one of our technicians go out uh, and help uh, with setting up technical services or computer services, then we get credit for that also. So there has to be that provision of financial services. Does it benefit our assessment area? Is it innovative? Is it complex? Uh, is it responding to a credit need, a community development service? And then is that service not routinely provided by others? We want to present that information uh, to the examiners. Uh, and on the next slide, you will see, uh, and certainly Lisa talked a lot about that, what some of our volunteer service activities have been as it relates to CRA service. Uh, board service, uh, committee services, uh, providing technical assistance, and certainly as it relates to workforce, uh, we've been involved with career day uh, presentations at nonprofits uh, that work with um, uh, uh, workforce development. Uh, we've done interviewing skills. We've taught interviewing skills. We've uh, taught how to fill out job applications, and certainly from a financial standpoint, how to budget, talk about credit counseling, uh, and certainly a lot of nonprofits work with individuals and families that uh, may meet the definition of unbanked or underbanked. Uh, and so we know that is a focus of what we uh, want, to, a service we want to provide, and we try to do that uh, as it relates to uh, providing services in our community. Um, that last bullet I'm proud to say is as far as as far as providing technical services on financial matters to organizations who apply for grants under the Federal Home Loan Bank Affordable Housing Program. We were just notified yesterday uh, that a grant we submitted on behalf of a nonprofit that works with individuals uh, that uh, are blind or visually impaired, uh, we just received notice that we got them a $475,000 grant through that program. Uh, and so we're very proud of that. Uh, and that nonprofit uh, approached us about this opportunity. And so that there's a two-way street going on where we're looking for uh, individuals, but we're also looking for uh, we're also listening to organizations that approach us and talk about opportunities that they, that they can give us. Uh, the next slide, uh, my last slide. Uh, talks about key things nonprofits can provide to a bank regarding their CRA exam. Um, we have to present, as uh, Lisa said, we have to uh, present to the examiners uh, activities that we believe demonstrate our responsiveness in meeting uh, the credit needs of the communities in which we are in, our assessment area. Uh, we present those, so we ask for CRA consideration uh, from the examiners. They're the only ones that can give us credit for it. And so the organization that we work with, uh, they give us information about the organization. They talk about uh, who they are, uh, what they provide, what, uh, what, what the description of their organization as it meets community development purpose. They can give us the date that our, we volunteered there. They can give us the name and the title of the associate providing uh, the service. Uh, they can give us um, uh, information that we can use to present to the examiners for CRA consideration on the service. Um, Stephen talked about data that organizations have. We need that data because that helps us determine what the credit needs of, the, uh, of our markets are. And so, we look at that, and an organization that understands what the bank's responsibilities are as it relates to CRA can be a valuable asset to the bank. Uh, they are extremely important because they have this information. In a lot of cases, we can just ask the, the nonprofit to provide us that documentation on their letterhead, and we can present that information to our examiners when it comes to a CRA exam. And so a nonprofit uh, can be, again, an extremely valuable partner when it comes to the CRA exam. And we have one uh, in uh, Tulsa Works. And so uh, I'd love to, uh, at this point, turn this presentation uh, over to uh, back to Michael, and he can talk about one of the relationships we've developed. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, Thank you Virgil. And uh, we're going to go next to Sabrina Ware, who's director of Tulsa Works and Job Connection for Goodwill in, in Tulsa for over 34 years. You can read further about her many distinguished uh, accomplishments. But in the interest of time, I'm, I'm going to turn it over to Sabrina and uh, talk about how she developed this bank partnership and the Tulsa Works experience. Sabrina? Hello, everyone. I, yes, I am Sabrina Ware, and we're happy to talk about our partnership with um, Arvest Bank and um, another bank here in our city. But the, the basically, we, de we decided to start our partnership with Arvest Bank because we share like like things. For example, um, our our mission of Goodwill Industries is to provide work opportunities, job training, and support services for people with disabilities or other employment barriers. Right there, that hits on every piece of the things that Stephen talked about and Lisa and also Virgil in regards to what the CRA requirements and obligations that have as a bank, but basically goes to the heartbeat of what Goodwill Industries of Tulsa does. Every day we're dealing with people who are underserved and also unbanked. And so right there the partnership marries very, very well. What we've done uh, with Arvest Bank is that they've been a part of our mock interviews with the Tulsa Works Career Academy where we're helping people get a skill set and also to get an earned credential and to get employment. That's our purpose. So what Arvest has done is given us folks to come in and teach our financial lunch and learns, not just one time, but every month of the year. Uh, the other thing that they've also done is uh, to do interviewing skills with our clients. Again, we do this all the time with our clients as we prepare them for the working world. Some who uh, are re-entering into the workforce, and then there are some who are entering in for the very first time. Uh, we serve folks that are from 17 years of age on and on up. So they could be just students getting ready to graduate from high school to those who are going to go into maybe a uh, retirement type of situation but still need to work to put food on the table. So in between all of that, they're earning a credential, there is a career pathway, but they still need uh, information on how to apply for jobs in today's world online applications, all those kinds of things. So those are the things that the Tulsa Works uh, Career Academy does. And so having the partnership with Arvest and the other banks that we've been working with helps to have extra hands that our staff may not have as far as expertise in the lending world, how to open up an account uh, for the very first time. These are things that we must equip our folks with if they're going to keep and maintain employment. I think our best way to show this is if we can queue up the video uh, that talks about what we're doing with another bank called Security Bank. Security Bank was interested in finding a partner for some kind of community involvement. And we actually stumbled across the Goodwill program on the Federal Reserve Bank's website. They had a link for um, community investment, and they listed a lot of different programs and projects. And we were immediately attracted to the Goodwill project because we really liked their mission statement of uh, work opportunities and job training. So the fact that this added a financial element to that, we thought this was really a perfect partnership for our bank. Our clients that come to Tulsa Works come from a variety of backgrounds, whether they may have been homeless or they may be now looking into the workforce to find a job because maybe a spouse has died or because of the economy and they needed to find a better job or actually to find not a job but a career. So you need to understand how to take care of your monies once a job is found. And most of our clients are coming from that background, may not have had the experience in saving for later, saving for emergencies, saving for retirement. All of these things needed to be taught and we thought it was very important to do so. It was something that the bank had decided that they they wanted to do. They were outreaching into the community, and uh, Don, the president, had asked for volunteers to help um, facilitate the training. Sometimes they talk about your credit score and keeping that up. Sometimes they talk about the simplicity of just opening an account. They make uh, something that might be scary to some people much more tangible and understandable. When I was looking for a job, I started the forklift certification class at Goodwill. 
After I completed that, I was hired and had been working for a while. Every so often, a case manager would check in on me and see how my job was going, if I needed any help. And um, one, one day they called and asked if they could come see me at work, and I didn't really know what was going on. And so I was like, okay, sure. They came, and she had a program she was offering me that if I wanted to start, um, open a savings account with $50, they would match me $50 at the end of the year. If I had saved $500, they would match me the other 450. One of the things that I had noticed with the need to save is I actually had some student debts that I had acquired from going to, to college and I hadn't had the chance to get that paid off. So coming into this program they virtually didn't have anything established, most of whom didn't even have an account open. And through completing the 12-month program, the average client now has $1,100 in their account. Not only had I saved a certain amount of money um, on my own, but by the savings match, it just kind of put me over the edge that I was able to finally um, do my goal of paying off that student debt. About three quarters of the way through the program, uh, my transmission on my car went out, which I didn't have a very good car at the time. I was able to use my savings to get a new car without completely draining it, and then by the end of the year, still had enough to be matched. During the program, after I had been saving, I decided that I would open Jack, my son, his own separate account. He is two years old now. He's worth about $2,500, and we're looking forward to getting him a car when he turns 16 and sending him to college without having to worry about that. You know, coming here and watching the success stories was great to know that the things that we had been able to teach them and the things that they had been able to learn from Goodwill has really set them down a really good path. It would amaze me the amount of money that they were able to put back. Just having that safety net is a big piece of, of mind and when you need it, you have it. At Security Bank, we're really excited to have this partnership with Goodwill. This is our second year and we can plan to continue it for a long time. Thank you, Security Bank, on the wonderful partnership that you lend to the Tulsa Works Training Program and Goodwill Industries as a whole. Congratulations on your giving spirit. Very nice. Uh Sabrina, that's, Sabrina that's, uh, that was a great explanation. And do you want to close with a comment, or do you want me to go to questions? Um, basically, yes, I would like to close with a comment, and that is, is that we can use our best bank and security bank as just examples, and, and we can work with any bank that is willing to uh, work with us. And, you know, we're just interested in partnership because we could take the security bank out of that video and put in XYZ Bank, and the same experience could happen. But what we're doing, we're changing lives one minute at a time. And so being able to do this goes so much greater. So we're happy to be on this and to talk about what we can do about helping partnerships grow within the banking institutions. Fantastic. Wonderful. Well, uh, I want to thank all the presenters, and I'm glad we have time for questions. Um, I, we're going to queue up uh, first some of uh, those that were pre-prepared, if we go to the next slide, um, and, uh, and we're also going to take some from the audience. Before I even go, next slide, please. Uh, before I go to any of these three questions, there is one I, that came in in the chat box, which I think is a very good one. And the question is, do you have to be a nonprofit to qualify for a partnership uh, with a bank in order for the bank to get CRA credit? And uh, the question really is, like, could a small business who is developing training needs uh, or responding to training needs for job seekers with disabilities qualify for a partnership with a bank where a bank might uh, invest and support that type of training activity? Um, Anyone want to try taking that question? Uh, maybe Virgil, I, I'll try you. Yes, sir. Well, thanks, Michael. Certainly, uh, we are looking for uh, those uh, partnerships uh, that, um, that that give us CRA consideration, and you don't have to be partnering with a nonprofit uh, to get CRA consideration. Uh, certainly, in this example, we're talking about a service. Uh, and 
if we can demonstrate to our examiners uh, that um, it meets uh, the uh, requirements uh, for CRA service consideration, and uh, it sounds like that would certainly from uh, the uh, economic development test, uh, then uh, we would certainly um, present that type of activity to our examiner during a CRA exam. Great. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm going to go to a second question from the chat box, and then we'll get to the questions on the screen. Um, uh, commenter in the chat box uh, wondered whether is too much credit being given for volunteerism, and this probably goes to the bank examination side, so Steve uh, or Lisa, um, you know, is there a way of weighting volunteer activity versus uh, for example, uh, in the chat box, the person mentioned, could that be the same weight as, as really helping create affordable lending or safe and low-cost banking accounts? How is there, a, is there a weighting of one type of activity versus the other? And I wonder if uh, Steve or Lisa might be able to comment. Sure. This yep. is Lisa. Um, first, when we look particularly at the intermediate small banks, and the large banks, um, we look at their community development activities. For large banks, we review lending, which includes community development lending, investments and services, and then for an intermediate small bank, and each one of those three is rated and rolls into the overall rating for that assessment area, and then for each assessment area, that rolls into the overall rating for the bank. For intermediate small banks, we look at lending, and then we look at community development activities in aggregate. So that can be loans, investments, and services all in. You can think of it as a bucket. So one bucket for lending, one bucket for community development overall. For large banks, the lending activities, the lending test, is 50% of the rating. So a bank cannot service test or investment test its way into a satisfactory rating. And the bank has to have a satisfactory rating on the lending test to get satisfactory overall. For an intermediate small bank where it's the two tests, they have to be satisfactory on the lending test in order for any of their community development to count in that second component of their rating. So yes, there is a weighting process per se and the lending test gets the greatest weight. Terrific, thank you. Um, I'm gonna go to my first question here on the slide and, and perhaps go back to Virgil. Uh, you've worked for a number of banks, but I suspect, and as you mentioned, uh, uh, it would be a similar uh, evaluation from a bank's perspective. What are you looking for from uh, a community nonprofit or, or any type of partner to support workforce development activities that uh, might qualify for CRA credit? Are there, are there key elements to a partnership? Well, I, I, I believe that they certainly are. Um, we are looking for the partnerships with the organizations that uh, have, as Stephen talked about, they have data that supports uh, what they are involved in and data that they can serve, uh, that they can share with us. Uh, when we are in the midst of a CRA exam, uh, we are asking the examiners to to give us CRA service consideration. Uh, uh, and so we have to prove that we have that information to demonstrate that uh, we should get consideration for an activity. What are they looking for? Uh, the examiners are looking for the documentation that says, well, how is this a credit need? A nonprofit that uh, has done assessment studies or has the ability, say if it's a, uh, an affiliate of NDA, I'm sure, in, or NDI rather, would have information about uh, their clientele, what the needs are maybe in a specific area where we are involved, uh, where our assessment area is. If an organization can give us that type of information uh, that shows uh, that um, they are meeting, uh, that, 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 that there is a credit need, a community need for support. Those type of organizations, Michael, that keep that information, those are extremely important for us, and we can use that information to help us during a CRA exam. And so 
organizations that have uh, information, that collect information, and they can share information about their clients, uh, are they low mod income, uh, is this a need uh, that the community uh, ha has uh, demonstrated is there, that type of information, we can then fold that information into what we present to our examiners uh, to help us during the CRA exam. Fantastic. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to go next to uh, Sabrina, and the uh, question is, uh, I, I know you talked about uh, Security Bank, and, and we also have uh, Virgil representing Arvest Bank. How did, you, how did you go about just starting or, or starting a conversation with a bank that then led to supporting your workforce development uh, activities? Um. I'm going to have uh, Adam Irby, who actually used to work for Arvest Bank and now is here working at Goodwill Industries in Tulsa Works Capacity, to talk about how that began. Go ahead, Adam. Okay. Uh, thank you, Sabrina. Um, uh, I was working with Arvest Bank in a lending capacity, and Virgil actually came and spoke to our Tulsa group about different uh, opportunities that, that we could look at getting involved in. And uh, our Tulsa CRA group or committee I got involved with the uh, Alliance for Economic Inclusion here, and uh, they presented us with some opportunities to send people out to Goodwill to do the mock interviews, do financial education uh, seminars and the career readiness uh, courses, and I started to go and pretty much on a monthly basis or, or every other month would be out at Goodwill um, helping people with the uh, interview process, giving them um, coaching and preparation for upcoming interviews as they finish the credential courses that they were going through. Um, also the financial, uh, what we call lunch and learns, where we would just field questions from, from people who are getting ready to enter that job market or may just have gotten that job and trying to figure out how to open checking accounts and, and bank accounts and, and things of, of that nature. And uh, that's how we got started. Great, great, thank you. I'm going to go to the next question uh, to Lisa. And uh, uh, several times uh, over the presentations here today, there, it came up the importance of documentation and data. Um, what are you looking for from a bank that would meet OCC requirements that would then justify the CRA credit for workforce development and obviously other kinds of activities that support low moderate income individuals? Sure, so as examiners, we're flexible in reviewing the information that the bank provides to make sure that it reasonably demonstrates that they're meeting a community development purpose. So, and Virgil talked about some of the documentation that they would uh, request from an organization. So generally the first step is determining if the organization that the bank's partnering with has a primary purpose of community development. So are they serving the needs for affordable housing? Are they an organization that provides community services targeted to low moderate income people and so forth? And so in this case, we would be looking at the information to determine, does the organization have a primary purpose of workforce development targeted to lower moderate income people? And so that does not automatically mean that if that's the expectation, but that's one of the steps we would look at. And so then we would look at if it's a specific program the bank's supporting. So maybe it's an organization that has a broader mission, but the bank is supporting a specific program that has a primary purpose of workforce development. So an example could be a local community college or a technical school that's broadly serving the community, but the bank is specifically supporting a job training program that's targeted to lower moderate income people within that overall college program. And again, specifically we're looking in this case, if it's workforce development, is this a job training or workforce program targeted to low moderate income people? And, and, it, and so, you know, in answering this question, it's also important that organizations that are partnering with the banks uh, be good partners in providing that information to the bank on where you work geographically and who you serve with respect to lower moderate income people and also providing any other information on the outcomes and the impact that the partnerships realize because that helps the bank to be able to tell their story to the regulators about their activities in their assessment areas, in their regional areas, and the impact and responsiveness of those activities. Great. Can we see the next set of uh, questions, please? So um, this question, I think, for Steve, although current data indicates record low un unemployment for working-age adults with disabilities, 
Um, uh, what what I guess the really the gist of this question is um, banks uh, certainly with the efforts you made and others where it's clear workforce development is an area that can can uh, be a, a basis for CRA credit. How can bank regulators direct banks to look more closely at whether or not a, a proposed workforce development activity of a bank uh, could pay more attention to people low income with disabilities? Yeah, no, I appreciate that. And I think that, you know, I, I, I think that um, bank regulators don't so much direct uh, banks in doing certain things, but more as, you know, raising awareness about uh, different issues. And so I think by um, creating greater awareness um, among banks about the opportunities and, you know, the risks and rewards and uh, of, of working with individuals with disabilities, that can go a long way. And, you know, within the Federal Reserve System, I think that works more on the side of the community development department that I'm a part of rather than on the bank regulator side. Um, so raising that awareness is a, is a big piece of it. I think also that organizations that work with individuals with disabilities you know, have the, the ability, the option to contact the regulators to provide input into you know, what they see happening in the market this is um, often happens in, in advance of CRA examinations where regulators are looking for input to see what is the, the performance context that the bank is operating in, looking to see what are the needs that are out there. So being able to, to direct information to regulators to give them a better perspective of what's happening is useful. But I think also, I think, uh, you know, Lisa may want to weigh in on this. I think she's probably much more directly involved in this, might have something to say. Okay. Lisa? Uh, sure. And so, you know, I think it kind of ties into to the next question as far as how banks can be more proactive, you know, in impacting yeah. LMI persons with disabilities. And so, you know, banks can identify and connect with workforce development organizations in their local markets and, you know, community affairs officers that one of the ways that we can assist in connecting with who those organizations are in their markets. Um, particularly in Florida, we have a really good relationship with our NDI contact here in Florida, and we're always engaging with him, Michael Roche. So, you know, we, we can certainly be as helpful in assisting with that process. And then if you're working with broader job training and workforce organizations, you know, talk about opportunities to support specific programs for low and moderate income people with disabilities. And if there are no programs or few programs, you know, talk about how to support creating a program or expanding a program to target those needs in your communities. Great. Thank you. I'm going to go next to back to Virgil is, um, uh, and this, uh, again, we're, we're some of the comments in the chat box is, can you go into more detail uh, about groups that approach a bank? So uh, we've shown this example with goodwill today. Um, you know, is there, is it, can it be broken down into simple, hey, here are the first three steps to make? Um, and it's a variation on the question on the screen is, uh, as, a, as, a, as a bank, what are you, what are you seeking in, in a partner? Or how can a, a community nonprofit or another group get your attention for a potential CRA partnership? Okay. Thanks, Michael. Um, I can tell you one of the things that, that happens if, if a nonprofit understands what the Community Reinvestment Act is all about, uh, if they understand uh, what the bank's responsibilities or obligations uh, are as it relates to CRA, uh, that's, that's the first step uh, because I've, I've had uh, some nonprofits or, or some groups uh, that would call and say, hey, I want some of that CRA money. Uh, I mean, it's like a bucket of money laying around or something. I, I mean, I, I look to, uh, and more responsive to organizations uh, that say, 
hey, we think we can help you with your obligations under the Community Reinvestment Act, and we would like to talk to you about it. Michael, quite frankly, that would get my attention. Uh, because uh, I would think, me, well, this bank or this organization knows something about CRA, and they're trying to help us. And so if, it is, if it's something that um, certainly we uh, have the capacity uh, uh, to do, and, and, uh, then we're going to certainly, I'm going to listen to anybody that calls and, and, and tells me that uh, they can help us with our obligations under the CRA and they'd like to talk to us about it. Um, that gets my attention. Uh, I look for um, assessment reports uh, from United Way organizations or community action organizations that work with low and moderate income individuals and uh, I might reach out to them uh, because I see the clients that they're serving, and I know they're serving low and moderate income individuals and clients. Uh, for example, if you look at Tulsa Works um, website, uh, and they talk about the clients that they're looking for, and they say some of their client re uh, requirements may be that they're on temporary assistance for needy families, or they are receiving food stamps, or they're receiving some type of housing assistance, or they meet the definition of low income, that's an organization that is going to get my attention because they are serving low and moderate income individuals and, and families. Uh, and so organizations that would call with that, and I do a little due diligence on them, and I see that we can have a partnership that would be beneficial for us and for the bank, then we, we will have a conversation about that. Great. Can I have the next slide, please? Fine, thank you. So uh, let me go to Sabrina. And on the slide here, it says, question number eight, what are your outcomes you've achieved? I think your video uh, was a great uh, uh, way to portray actual uh, individuals uh, who have benefited from, from the banking partnership. I, I'm going to switch this question a little bit, uh, Sabrina, and ask you uh, whether, as you look ahead, what are some potential expansion of, of your partnership uh, with, as you said, multiple banks in, in, uh, in the Tulsa area? Well, you know, we were just talking about that. What's interesting to us is that maybe we don't think as broad or as high as we should because we're also, we're beginning, uh, clients are beginning to step out from uh, no, living in poverty or being under employed to now becoming full-time employed and being able to be banked for the very first time or, or re-entering it for the very first time. So a lot of times we need uh, to talk about things that would help us to better uh, work our programs. For example, we have a Google IT program, and so we need better equipment to be able to teach this, you know, this particular skill set to get a higher paying job. We also serve people who are on the autism spectrum. They hold a little iPad mini that basically helps them to lower their anxiety when they're feeling a certain way while they're on the job. This iPad mini has apps on it, and what it does is helps them to kind of make sure that they do the things they need to do so that anxiety is gone and they can continue working. Uh, I think when you talk about disabilities, we're not just talking about people with um, you know, in a wheelchair or physical type of disabilities. We're talking about even disadvantaging conditions that perhaps will make a person not able to even look for a job um, or just uh, don't have the encouragement to look for a job. That's the kind of folks that we actually have the opportunity to serve at Tulsa Works Career Academy. So I think we just need to make sure we look deeper and wider when we serve clients. No matter what the need is, we'll be able to have those type of um, have those types of training programs, but also to have the information that's needed so that when we go to a bank, listen, we can talk about how many placements that we've done in a, in a certain year. We can talk about how many people that we served and touched in a certain year. We can talk about how many people uh, received the goal of making sure that they got out of financial debt. We can give you that information at a moment's notice here at Goodwill Tulsa. Yeah, fantastic. Fantastic. Well, a question came in from the chat box 
And something we work with quite a bit uh, is on ABLE accounts, Achieving Better Life Experience, which is a tax advantage savings account, somewhat like uh, college savings accounts, but with much broader uh, use of the funds as they come out of the uh, savings or investment account um, can be used for uh, workforce development activity, transportation, housing, healthcare costs that are not covered, purchase of technology, and other things. Um, I, I thought, Sabrina, your example was great where the banks were that you mentioned were matching money that was put in savings. Um, and, and certainly a bank was getting CRA credit for that activity. Am, am I right? Did I hear that right? You heard it correct, definitely. Yeah. So the question in the chat box is, uh, we haven't seen it happen yet, but and maybe this is back to uh, Steve or, or Lisa uh, or Virgil, I would assume that if a bank chose to help seed an ABLE account, for low, low income individuals with disabilities or match money in an ABLE account, um, that, that would qualify for CRA credit. Would, am I correct? This is Virgil. I would uh, certainly present that uh, during a CRA exam, I would present that as a CRA investment uh, yeah. to the examiner and ask for CRA investment consideration uh, if we provided seed money like that. So I, I would certainly present it for CRA consideration. Sure. And this is Lisa, and it could also be considered under um, retail banking services, depending on how the account and the ability to provide that, that account access. So uh, particularly with, with the match savings accounts, often we'll see banks get the service credit for setting up and, and um, facilitating, administering the account, and then if they're doing the matching, then they get the investment credit for the dollars that they're matching. Right. You know, yeah, I, and I think, I oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, no, I, I think that's a great example because it really plays to the strength of a financial institution. You know, um, it, you know it, it only, only a bank um, and credit unions, but in this case, a bank can take deposits and being able to provide a service that no other organization or community can do it, you know, is a great reason to work with a financial partner like this. And this is also an area where there is you know, so many little devils in the details and technical considerations that a bank can help work through when you're looking at a, a match savings program. And there's, there's great um, you know, examples and experiences and learnings around the country from ABLE accounts, also from uh, individual development accounts in particular over the years that can be applied to this. I think it's great. Great. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go to just a, a kind of variation on the final question number nine that's up as we're running out of time is, you know, one takeaway. Maybe I'll start back with you, Steve. For the audience out there, and it's a mixed audience, uh, people in the disability community, people in the financial community, um, what, what would be one point of advice uh, you would give about this uh, uh, potential uh, uh, great ways to uh, garner CRA uh, credit uh, for activities related to workforce development? I think one is, you know, is really building on um, Virgil's comments. It's, a bit, it's you know, do your do a little bit of homework and then uh, understand the banks that you're going after. Um, recognize what you have to to offer to that bank to build a partnership, and um, you know, go in to, with the long long view in mind. It's not to say, you know, hey, you know, we want uh, we want a grant from you, a type of grant that you could get from any business on Main Street. But it's more to what, you know, how can we partner together in the long haul to, um, you know, to build these communities, serve the people we're wanting to serve, help you reach your CRA goals. Uh, look at it, look at it that way. I think it really is partnership, relationship based um, throughout. Fantastic. And uh, Lisa, uh, closing point. Sure. I, I think as. It's already been said by Stephen and Virgil. It really starts with having a conversation with the, with the bank about 
your organization and what you do, where you serve, who you work with, and how you all can partner together to help advance the inclusive workforce development activities and activities related to people with disabilities. Great. And uh, Virgil? Yes, uh, thanks, Michael. I, I would say that um, you know, the organization needs to be mindful of, of the bank in this case. I've worked for Bank of America, uh, and Bank of America is a bank, commercial bank, but it's certainly different from a bank I've worked at locally, Metropolitan Bank. And so understanding what the capacity is of, uh, of a bank, uh, I think, is extremely important uh, when it, it comes to approaching the bank. Uh, and certainly working for a bank that may have a dedicated uh, CRA officer or, or director of CRA like what we have, uh, and then approaching a bank that may have a person that's not only doing CRA, but they may be doing marketing and they may be doing risk man. I mean, they may be doing several things. And so understanding the capacity of a bank, I think, is also important when it comes to approaching the bank uh, and, and talking to them about uh, CRA activity. Um, all banks um, are different, and Lisa certainly pointed that out with regard to the different sizes and different obligations. But I think that's extremely important uh, for a community group uh, to understand um, uh, the, the capacity of the bank they, are, they may be approaching. Great. Great. And Sabrina, from a community organization standpoint, what uh, uh, one last piece of advice. From our standpoint is, is that we need to make sure that we understand what the CRA obligations are so that when we come, we don't come just with a handout, but we come knowing that there is true partnership in this. There is a win-win situation for both entities, be it the bank being able to take care of their obligations CRA-wise. So we need to make sure that we understand and we can talk the language a little bit better than we ever had before so that we can bring true partnership together where both sides win. Fantastic. If we go to the next slide, please. Next slide. Oops. No. Um, okay. Well, there there are some, I believe, further resources listed. We urge you to uh, visit uh, the National Disability Institute uh, org website and and the part of the the, the website for the center for uh, Disability Inclusive Community Development. Can we go, is there a next slide? Or we're not on this deck, maybe not. Okay, I do want to let uh, everyone know we have our last and final fifth webinar in a five-part series next month on November 20th from 3 to 4.30 Eastern Time. Uh, the topic will be opportunities for banks to better serve people with disabilities, mining FDIC data. We will have Keith Ernst, Associate Director for Consumer Research and Examination Analytics from FDIC, and our own Nanette Goodman, Research Director at National Disability Institute. It will be a lot about data, what we've learned about financial behavior and mapping uh, where low-income people with disabilities live. I think it will be beneficial both to uh, representatives from the financial community and representatives from the disability community. So I hope you will uh, sign up for that event. Uh, let me thank you, uh, our panelists, uh, Virgil, Sabrina, Lisa, and Steve. Really a, a very, very uh, practical, informative uh, conversation. Uh, this webinar will be placed in a few weeks, uh, uh, will be archived on our website. Uh, do share it with people who may have missed uh, the program today. And uh, thank you all for helping us continue to drive forward the message uh, and uh, the motivation and uh, what we hope will be increased activity related to inclusive community development that benefits people with disabilities and their families nationwide. So thank you, and I hope uh, we'll see you in November, November 20th, for our last webinar in this series this year. 
Thanks again and have a wonderful afternoon. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.